Hi, my name is Ken. And my name is Jason. And today we're actually playing Arkham Horror. Finally. published back in 1987 by a company named Chaosium. It was designed by a game designer at the time, uh, Richard Lanius. It was actually pretty successful for the time, and it was uh, thematically based off of uh, Chaosium's own uh, Call of Cthulhu RPG. Mm -hmm. uh, the rights were eventually purchased uh, from Richard Lanius uh, in about 2004 by an online company named Skoto, who was eventually planning to have it uh, published through Fantasy Flight Games. The game went through a number of revisions uh, by all involved parties, uh, mainly to modernize it, mm -hmm. and it was uh, eventually published by Fantasy Flight Games in 2005. Fantasy Flight Games actually purchased the rights to Chaosium's uh, Mythos card game, which was a game they were publishing back in the 90s, and they released it back uh, in 2004 as the Call of Cthulhu collectible card game. Uh, they eventually later changed this in 2008 to be the Call of Cthulhu living card game. Yeah, and since then, uh, Fantasy Flight pretty much steamrolled through the entire Lovecraftian mythos. More or less. Uh, they've published how many expansions now for Arkham Horror? Uh, six oh, or seven? About seven, I think. Uh, there's tons of cards for uh, Call of Cthulhu, Living Card Game. It's one of their big card game products. Uh, it's one of their main card game products, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so they've done quite a bit in that vein. They're even publishing some novels now. In fact, actually, just this year alone, uh, Fantasy Flight has put out two more uh, Mythos-based games. They put out uh, Match the Madness uh, in the winter-spring sort of area. Thereabouts, yeah. Yep. And then uh, just uh, back in the fall leading, in, leading up to now, uh, they published Elder Sign. Uh, so two more Mythos-based games in this, mm -hmm. in this year or so. And they already have a bunch of uh, print-on-demand expansions for Match the Madness. And apparently with Elder Sign, they've actually port of this game to basically every conceivable uh, mobile device. So you've got your, your iPad, your iPod Touch, all the OS, uh, iOS devices. Yeah, Android, Mac. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, this is big. Like, this is a big thing for anybody who loves playing games uh, based on the Lovecrafting mythos. So, yeah. Uh, another really cool thing about all these games that they're putting out is that uh, all, the, all the story and the fluff, as some people will call it, um, of the... Arkham Horror, Mansions of Madness, Elder Sign, the books, uh, and pretty much everything they put out so far, the living card game. Um, all of it is actually based within the same universe. So they're not just creating separate games, they're creating separate games that are like little modular pieces of the, the same universe. So if you play a character from one game and that character's in the, in the next game, you know that although they may not necessarily be the exact same mechanics and such, you know more or less what their story is, you know, how they got interested in the, the mythos or how they got wrapped up in this, or even just generally what their special abilities will all revolve around. That's a really awesome thing. Arkham Horror is a cooperative game wherein uh, each player takes the role of an investigator uh, moving around Arkham and trying to work together to uh, stop a being from beyond the veil of human consciousness from breaking through into our world. Mm -hmm. The way the players win is they close enough gates, which are portals into these other worlds, uh, or they drive back the Great Old One should they awaken. This is actually a game where you're playing against randomized board elements, so it's very much a player versus environment, so you can actually play this solo, which is kind of neat. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we should note is that uh, Arkham Horror is a very, very rules-heavy game. It's not really a complicated game, it's just that there's a lot to know. Um, so we do, do apologize in advance if we miss anything on this, because I think it's more or less bound to happen. Uh, but just bear with us. We're trying to make sure we get all the most important, like, high-concept stuff, and then we're trying, trying to get the lower-concept stuff as well. Hey, everybody. This thing Cthulhu lives. The deep ones wait you know, swimming in the sea. Their numbers they will grow, swimming safe and free. So first of all, we're going to go over the components for Arkham Horror. These are the investigator sheets. These are the various uh, investigator tokens. So these are the standees for the characters. Uh, these are the money tokens. 
We have stamina and sanity. These are clue tokens. Skill sliders. And we also have some miscellaneous tokens here, such as the doom tokens with elder sign symbols on the uh, other side. The first player token. And there's a few miscellaneous tokens that we won't really go into. You'll see them uh, throughout the video, though. These are the various investigator cards that uh, come with the game. So uh, we have Silver Twilight Lodge memberships, retainers, curses, blessings, bank loans, deputy cards, standard items, unique items, skills, spells, and allies. These are the great old one cheats. These are the gate markers and monster markers. These are the Otherworld Encounter cards and the Mythos cards. These are the various Arkham Encounter decks. These are the dice. And finally, this is the game board. He's not dead. Now, to set up Arkham Horror, first just buy a bigger table. You don't have a table big enough to hold this. Alternatively, you can put multiple tables together for the same effect. Once you have a table big enough, you can unfold the board in the center of the table. So once you have the board set up in a reasonable location, take the investigator tokens and place them to the side of the table that's uh, accessible by all players. So, maybe on this side. Next, you're going to want to randomly determine the starting player, uh, who will end up getting this shiny little token. Uh, to do that, um, I don't know, Jason, what do you say? Have a rousing game of Dungeon Quest Combat for old time's sake? Sure. Alright, sounds good. Ra, 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 Rock, beat, scissors, I get the first player token. When it comes time to choose your investigators, there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, you can start with the first player and hand around the stack, and they can just choose one. Uh, usually what we do for the sake of simplicity is we just randomly distribute two to each player and then they just choose from there. Alright, so I get two characters randomly. Jason gets two characters randomly. So my options were between Mandy Thompson and Daryl Sims. I'm going to go with Daryl Sims, the photographer. Out of Monterey Jack and Joe Diamond, I'm picking Joe Diamond. So now we return the rest of the investigators to the box. Next, you randomly determine the great old one. Uh, there's a number of ways you can do this as well. Random is usually how we like to do it. Uh, you could, in theory, pick two and choose one of those. Uh, one of the things I like to do is pick one and then hide it, and then you don't actually know who it is until the end. So we'll go with that. So now we're going to set the area for the Great Old One. Set the Mythos cards, uh, the Gate cards, and the Arkham Encounters cards all up by the Great Old One. Make sure that when you're setting up the gate cards and the mythos cards that you're actually shuffling them before you put them down. Set up the monster cup, or in our case the monster bag, and set that beside the great old ones area. To finish setting up the great old one side of the board, put down the gate tokens. Next you're going to want to set up the investigator side of the board. To do so, retrieve the investigator cards and place them like such. Make sure the money Sanity and Stamina, and Clue Tokens are all in a nice accessible location by the Investigators. And make sure all Investigators have enough room on their sides of the table for their respective items and such. Now it's time to give all the Investigators their starting items. So first you'd start with the Fixed Possessions. In the case of Daryl Sims, he starts off with $4, a Clue Token, and a Retainer, which is a special item. Joe Diamond, on the other hand, starts off with $8, three Clue Tokens, and one common item, which is a 45 automatic. So make sure that when you give everybody their fixed possessions, that everybody receives three skill sliders, and their maximum amount of stamina and sanity. After all the fixed items have been distributed, now you can shuffle the item decks over here. The reason why you don't want to shuffle them up beforehand is because you're going to be giving up fixed possessions. Anybody who has a fixed possession is going to have to go through these decks and retrieve the specific items, which means they're just going to have to be reshuffled anyway. Now, if you just bought this game and you're just setting it up for the first time, then yeah, you may want to give them a little bit of shuffle beforehand. But otherwise, you're going to want to wait until this step. Retrieve the appropriate character sandies and place them in their starting locations. Now, you must place one clue token in each unstable location. These are the ones with the red diamonds, instead of the green ones. 
If you previously had the Great Old One hidden, because you were pausing for dramatic effect, you can now reveal him. And in this game, we're going to be fighting against yogg the key in the gate. Next, we have uh, much to do about these other various tokens. Take a little tiny red uh, terror icon and put it on zero of the terror track. Take the barred location items and, I don't know, place them near the Great Old One, I guess. Take the exploration tokens and place them beside the gates. And take the activity markers and, I don't know, place them beside the barred tokens. Make sure the dice are accessible by all. Uh, I'm going to give Jason the plain white dice, whereas I am going to take the Elder Sign dice. Hand out the random possessions to all players. And now you are ready to play. So setup's going to go a lot faster if everyone gets involved. Absolutely. If your wanker friends aren't helping you out, you can actually just sacrifice them to the great old ones in order to, uh, uh, I mean, just ask them nicely to uh, help out. Yeah, it's going to go much quicker if uh, everyone basically has their own individual jobs. That's true. First off, more, most importantly, you're going to want to make sure that everybody has an investigator card assigned to them. After everybody's chosen the investigator cards, you can assign one person to set up the Great Old Ones area of the board. Have one player assigned to set up the players area, and have one player assigned to the general setup of the board. So each turn is broken down into five phases. The upkeep phase, movement phase, Arkham Encounters phase, Otherworld Encounters phase, and Mythos phase. And each turn, every player actually performs each phase uh, before moving on to the next phase. So this isn't uh, a game where each player has their own individual turn. It's really, you know, a group turn. Now on the very first turn, before the first upkeep phase, uh, the first Mythos card is actually drawn and resolved by the first player. In the event that the Mythos card drawn is actually a rumor, then you discard it and draw another one. So as mentioned, the first phase of every turn is the upkeep phase. Now at this point, this is where you would first of all refresh any exhausted cards. So that means flipping cards back over if they were previously flipped face down. Certain cards have upkeep costs or actions, uh, so you would satisfy those at this point. And finally, you can actually adjust your skill sliders according to your focus. It should be noted that this is the only time when you can adjust your skill sliders. You may be tempted later on to uh, adjust them during the turn, but in reality, the rules say that you have to adjust them now. Alright, so next up is the Arkham Movement phase. So, during this phase, each player gains a number of movement points equal to their speed, uh, modified by any applicable modifiers they have on cards. And movement points may be spent to move along the yellow lines between street areas and locations. Moving along each of these lines costs one movement point. And if you end your turn in a space with clue tokens, you may take all of them. Throughout the game, there are also going to be monsters appearing on the board. In the event that you enter a space with a monster, you have a choice of either evading it or fighting it. If you attempt to evade it and you are successful, you can continue moving and spending your movement points if you have any left. If you fail to evade it, it deals its combat damage to you and you enter combat with it. And if you start combat, your movement ends immediately. In the event that there are multiple monsters in the space, you must fight or evade each one in the order you choose. If you fight monsters, regardless of if you win or lose the combat, your movement phase ends. If your investigator should happen to be in the, an other world during the movement phase, you actually receive no movement points. This is important to note because there are some cards that actually allow you to use movement points for other things, but in the other worlds, you actually do not uh, get those movement points. If you are already in the first section of the uh, other world, then you move to the second section. If you're in the second section of the other world, you actually move back to the board through one of the open gates to that world. It should be noted that if there are multiple gates to the same world, you can go through either one. It doesn't have to be the one that you entered through. Certain effects will cause an investigator to become delayed. If you are delayed, then you simply lay your standee down, and delayed characters receive no movement points and cannot move from their location. They merely stand back up during the next movement phase. Next up is the Arkham Encounters phase. 
it is important to note here that this phase only affects players who are currently in Arkham. Any players that are in the other worlds do not actually do anything during the Arkham Encounters phase. In the event that you ended your movement in a street, you actually don't have an encounter, so you're merely skipped. If you're in a location, however, you can choose to either activate the location's text, if there is any. If there is no text, however, you simply take the appropriately colored deck, you shuffle it up, and you take one of the cards and resolve the text on that card that corresponds to the location you're in. Any monsters that appear as the result of an encounter do not stay regardless of the result of the encounter, and you can choose to fight or evade as you like. Gates that appear as the result of an encounter do stay, and they immediately suck in all present investigators, and all such investigators are immediately delayed. Sealed locations, locations that are marked with an elder sign, are stable, and thus gates and monsters cannot appear there, regardless of what it says in the card. If you begin your Arkham Encounters phase in a location that has a gate in it, you're immediately drawn into the other world. So you would go to the first part of the other world space. Players that begin with a Explored Marker, however, are not drawn back into the gates. However, Explored Markers are lost immediately if the character moves away from the location. Next is the Other World Encounters phase. So this phase occurs for everyone who happens to be in the Other World, and in this case all investigators that are still in Arkham are skipped. Each Other World is associated with two or more of the four colors of Other World Encounters. So yellow, red, green, or blue. When drawing Other World Encounters, you must continue drawing cards until you've drawn one that matches one of the colors of the other world that you are in. There will usually be several different uh, text areas on these cards. If there is one that corresponds to the other world that you're actually in, then you read this and resolve it. Otherwise, you read the other section and resolve that. Again, any monsters encountered in this way do not stay on the board if evaded or in the case of unsuccessful combat. The final phase of each turn is the Mythos phase. At the start of the Mythos phase, the starting player draws a Mythos card. There are several steps to resolving Mythos card, which I'll go through briefly here. First of all, you open a gate and spawn monsters. Each Mythos card has an icon denoting what location has a gate open. In this case, a gate opens at the Historical Society. In the event that the location has an Elder Sign, no gate or monsters actually appear. If the location has a gate already, a monster surge occurs, in which case you draw monsters from the cup equal to the number of gates already on the board, or the number of players, whichever is greater, and you distribute the monsters evenly as possible across all gates. If, however, the gate location has no gate yet, then first of all you remove any clue tokens that are there. They're simply discarded. You advance the Doom track by one by adding a Doom token, to the first available spot, and you add a randomly drawn gate to that location. Finally, you draw a monster and add it to that location, or two monsters if you're playing with five or more players. Next, you place a clue token at the location indicated, in this case the Silver Twilight Lodge. This may lead to more than one clue token being at a location, and that's fine. You only place the clue token if there is no gate there. If there's a gate, you simply lose the clue token. If there happens to be an investigator at that location, they automatically get all of the clue tokens that are placed. And if there are multiple investigators, they can actually choose to split them up however they wish. In the event that they can't decide, the first player chooses. Next up is monster movement. All monsters have a dimensional symbol in the lower right corner. At the bottom of each mythos card is a section split into two different colors, white and black. Any monsters that have the dimensional symbols matching anything in the white colored box are moved along the white arrows on the board. Anything matching the dimensional symbols in the black section are moved along the black colored arrows on the board. Monsters entering a space with one or more investigators stop moving immediately. There are also several different border colors for monsters, and these indicate different movement types. Monsters with black borders just have standard movements, so they simply move along the arrows as I previously indicated. 
Monsters with yellow borders are stationary and do not move. Monsters with green borders have unique movement, so you actually have to flip them over and read the back to see what they do during the movement phase. Monsters with red borders are fast, meaning that they move twice along the indicated color arrow. And monsters with blue borders are actually flying. When they are activated, if they happen to be adjacent to an investigator that is in the streets, they immediately move to that investigator. If they are not, then they move to the sky, which is a special box over on this side here. If they are already in the sky during the phase when they are activated, they simply attack any investigator that happens to be in the streets. In the event that there are multiple investigators in the streets at the time, then the first player actually gets to choose which monsters attack who. Next, you read the actual text of the card and resolve that. There are actually different types of uh, Mythos cards, and they have different types of effects. Some of them will say Headline, in which case you simply resolve the text and discard the card. If there's a lasting effect, you may want to actually use the activity markers to denote that. Some cards are also Environment cards, which this one actually is. That has a lasting effect, and it stays in play until the next environment card is drawn, which then replaces it. And finally, there are rumor cards. These are particularly powerful cards, and they stay in play until they're actually resolved successfully or failed and activated. In the event that another rumor is drawn while a rumor is currently active, you actually discard it and draw again. Finally, at the very end of the Mythos phase, you pass the first player token from the current first player to the player at their left. Next we're going to go over these skills uh, located on the character sheets. As you can see, very easily, there are six skills that each character has with them. However, two skills are paired amongst each other. Speed is paired with Sneak, Fight is paired with Will, and Lore is paired with Luck. When you make a skill check, you are told to use one skill. You roll dice equal to your total in that skill. This is actually considered to be your dice pool. Modifiers will be in brackets, and these will apply to your dice pool. Uh, so they will add dice or subtract dice. Sometimes it'll say zero, in which case there's no modifier. Difficulties will be in square brackets. And these indicate the number of successes required. Now, um, unless there's actually square brackets, it's just assumed that the number of successes you need are one, unless otherwise noted. When making a skill check, success is always on a five or a six. However, it's possible to be blessed, in which case you also get successes on a four. Alternatively, it's also possible to be cursed, in which case you only get successes on a six. Clue tokens can be spent to actually add dice to your dice pool, even after the check has already been rolled. They can also be spent to roll a die when modifiers would otherwise put you in the negative. Because you cannot go to negative numbers in a skill check, you're assumed to always be at a minimum of zero, so by spending a clue token, you can essentially add in a skill die when you normally couldn't. As a note, any special abilities that allow you to re-roll checks also add all dice added in from clue tokens. There are a couple different special checks that are just a little different than just the standard six skill checks. So the four special skill checks are Combat, Horror, Evasion, and Casting. For all intents and purposes, special checks function just like skill checks, uh, because they're all based off of skills. However, there are generally special bonuses that apply to just these checks. Special checks benefit from bonuses to skills, but skills never benefit from bonuses to special checks. So again, it works one way, but not the other way. You can also think about it this way. There's a lot of things that add to combat checks, and combat is based on fight. And, you know, being really strong will help you in a fight, but having a sword will not help you lift a car. Mm, I guess that's arguable, but you understand what I'm talking about. Next, I'm going to go over how to cast spells. So first off, spells always have a casting modifier. This modifies your spell check dice pool, uh, which again is based off of lore. When you roll your dice, if you cast this successfully, you benefit from the spell. If not, it has no effect. And generally speaking, they're usually exhausted afterwards. Some spells have a sanity cost. Again, sometimes it's zero, but it's, the text is always listed there. That's the amount of sanity you need to spend to try to cast the spell. This sanity is actually spent regardless of whether or not the spell is successfully cast. Spells also often indicate when they can be cast, uh, such as like um, a certain phase or a certain time during a phase. Sometimes they're just any time, though. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Also, spells that add combat uh, generally have a hand associated with them. You only have two hands, and therefore you can only use two hands worth of combat-related items. Next, I'm going to explain evasion. If you choose to evade a monster, you must make an evade check, which is based off of your sneak. 
And this is going to be modified by the monster's awareness, as I already mentioned. On a success, you ignore the monster entirely. But on a failure, it actually deals its combat damage to you, and then you enter combat with it, starting from the beginning. And I'm going to explain how horror checks work now. If you choose to fight a monster, or fail to evade it, first you must make a horror check, which is modified by the monster's horror rating. On a success, you don't take any sanity loss. But on a failure, you take the indicated amount of sanity damage on the, monster, on the back of the monster token. Okay, now we're going to get more into the details of how combat works. So after the horror check is made, uh, you don't have to make another one for the rest of the combat. Uh, you now have two options. You can choose to fight, or you can choose to flee. If you flee, you must make an evasion check. This is again still modified by the monster's awareness. On a success, combat ends, and your phase is now over, and it goes to the next player's turn. On a failure, you take combat damage, and then you choose fight or flee again. If you choose fight, you must make a combat check. To succeed, you must get successes equal to the toughness of the monster. So in this case, the toughness is equal to the difficulty, like the square bracket uh, numbers from before. If you succeed, the combat ends and you claim the monster as a trophy. However, on a failure, you take combat damage and then you must choose to fight or flee again. The combat ends if you successfully fight on passing a combat check or flee, passing an evade check, or if you're reduced to zero sanity or stamina. Next we're going to go over monster markers. On the top right we have the awareness value. This actually modifies your evasion checks if you're trying to avoid this monster. On the bottom right we actually have the monster's dimensional symbol. These pertain to several other things which we've explained in other sections. On the back the monster has text. Sometimes these will come with specific things that, uh, special abilities that they have and other such things. Sometimes it'll just note specific conditions that happen during certain phases of combat. When engaging in combat the first thing you have to do is your horror check. Uh, this is modified by the monster's horror rating, which is down here, on the bottom left. If you fail the horror check, you actually have to take sanity any damage, so in this case it would be two. On the right side, we have the combat side of things. So again, here's the combat modifier, the combat rating of the monster, rather. Uh, this modifies your combat check. And combat damage. If you fail uh, the combat check against the monster, or other things as well, you take the monster's combat damage, which in this case would be one. And in the very center, we have the toughness of the monster. This is the number of successes that are required to actually succeed in a combat check against it. You have to get all or none, so you can't just build up the successes and get one success this round and two successes the next round. If they have three toughness, you have to get all three or not at all. Next, I'm just going to quickly go through the list of monster abilities, the special abilities that they may have on the back of their text. First, there's Ambush. Once the combat begins with a monster that has Ambush, the investigator cannot flee, they can only fight. There's the Endless, which is actually generally only on the masked creatures, but could, con could conceivably be on others. And these are returned to the cup when defeated, so they can never be collected as a trophy. There's Resistance, which comes in physical or magical. Um, weapons or spells of the indicated type only provide half the bonus rounded up uh, of its normal combat bonus uh, against the monster that has these types. And then there's physical or magical immunity. Uh, spells or weapons of the indicated type provide no combat bonus whatsoever. You'll still get your fight, and you can still use weapons of the opposite type as well. There's also the Nightmarish, uh, and Nightmarish will usually be associated with a number, so Nightmare 1, 2, 3, etc. Uh, a successful horror check against a Nightmarish monster will still deal that number worth of sandy damage, even if you've passed. Um, this, this may not be as bad as taking the full horror damage of the monster, but it's still not good. You only take Nightmarish, though, during the, the horror check, and you only do the horror check once. And there's the physical counterpart of that, Overwhelming. Successful combat checks will still deal X amount of physical damage, just like Nightmarish. Next we're going to go over how to close gates. So let's say on Joe Diamond's movement phase, he's come home from the Great Hall of Sileno. He's going to get an Explore token to note that he's actually explored that gate. And then, on the Arkham Encounters phase, he can choose to attempt to close that gate now. Exploration tokens are actually only gained from exploring other worlds. You can't get them any other way. Once you have one, you can now attempt to close the gate, again, on the Arkham Encounter space. To attempt to close the gate, you must make a Fight or Lore check, which is modified by the gate's dimensional power. This is this modifier right here. On a success, the gate is closed. You actually gain the gate as a gate trophy. And all monsters on the board with a, with a matching dimensional symbol are actually removed to the cup. They're not claimed as trophies, though, so don't try to do that. On a failure, there's no negative effect. You can attempt this again next turn while you still have the exploration token, but only if you still have the exploration token. So let's say when Joe Diamond came home, he actually had five clue tokens in his possession. 
This means he could actually seal the gate when he, uh, he closes it. So if he's made a successful fight or lore check, spending five clue tokens, still following the, all the rules for sealing the gates or closing the gates as normal, he then gets to place an elder sign from the reserve onto the gate's location. Now, whenever he has an event or whenever there's a Mythos card or any other sort of effect that says monsters or gates uh, appear or spawn there, they no longer are able to because this is now, as, for all intents and purposes, considered to be a stable location. However, clue tokens will still spawn there. Now, let's say that uh, Joe Diamond was uh, coming home now and he was just fortunate enough to have in his possession an Elder Sign. Characters using the Elder Sign unique item don't actually have to spend clue tokens to seal a gate. They actually just get to say, seal the gate by, by spending the item and returning it to the box. However, they have to spend one sanity and one stamina when they use it. As an added bonus though, after you've sealed the gate and you've taken your gate trophy and such, you actually remove one Doom token from the Great Old One's Doom track. Next I'm going to explain the monster limit and the outskirts. The monster limit in Arkham is its actually relatively simple to determine. It's actually just the number of players currently playing plus three. So in this game we would actually have two players and then plus three, that would make for five. So that means within all of Arkham, including this guy, we can only ever have a total of five monsters out until they then go to the outskirts. So if at any point we ever drew a sixth monster, we'd go right to the outskirts, and then any other monsters would be continuing to go out to the outskirts there. The outskirts, on the other hand, so this is just outside of Arkham, they're not quite in Arkham, and they're not actually monsters you can deal with per se. The maximum number of monsters allowed in the outskirts is also based on the number of players. Uh, it's actually eight minus number of players. So we have two players. Eight minus two is gonna be six. And now I'm gonna explain how the terror level works. Whenever the outskirts reaches its limit, you immediately remove all the monsters from the outskirts and throw them back into the cup. And then you increase the terror level by one. Whenever the terror level increases, you actually have to go to the allies deck and actually remove one ally, returning them to the box. This represents that people are actually leaving town. When the terror level reaches 3, 6, or 9, the general store, curiosity shop, and ye olde magic shop all actually close, respectively, in that order. And this, of course, again, is indicated right on the terror track there. If the terror level ever actually reaches 10, there is now no monster limit in Arkham. There can actually be uh, just, just a ton of monsters in Arkham at any given point in time. All the monsters from the outskirts are actually flooded right back into Arkham. Aside from the obvious bad effects of having no monster limit in Arkham, uh, there's also the additive effect of if the monsters in Arkham ever reach a level that is twice the normal monster limit, so in our two-player game that we're setting up here, that would be 10, because 2 plus 3 times 2 is 10. Then the Great Old One actually awakens. Next I'm going to explain how spending trophies works. So as the game goes through, you're going to accumulate things like uh, gate trophies and monster trophies. Uh, you can spend them at actually several different locations that are all actually along the board here. Uh, science building, river docks, police station, there's pretty much one in every single area that, uh, that allows you to do something with monster trophies or gate trophies. When something indicates toughness of uh, worth of monster trophies, this is equal to the toughness values of all the monsters you decide to spend. So if you had two monsters that both had toughness 3, and you needed to spend five toughness worth of monsters trophies, well, you definitely have enough, but that means you had one extra that you have to spend, because you're you, you can't keep change based on monster trophies. You have to spend, them, spend a trophy all or none. Alternatively, effects that, if, uh, that increase or decrease the toughness of monsters actually do count when you are spending monster trophies. So remember to sell high and kill low. Next, I'm just going to quickly run down how the Great Old One actually affects the way that you actually play the game. So, basically all Great Old One have some section related to their Warshippers. And they will often have some sort of special ability that makes the game much more difficult for the, for the investigators. They may also have other abilities related to the start of the battle or their combat and such, but that's not really too important here. We're just basically going over how the, uh, how the, the Great Old One affects your gameplay. These are things you're going to want to have to keep in mind during the game. All right, next we're going to go over investigator statuses. So first of all, insane. If you ever reach zero sanity, first of all, you lose half of your items and half of your clue tokens. Both are individually really ranked down. Uh, you lose all retainers and you are restored to one sanity. If this happens in Arkham, you are rushed to Arkham Asylum, right here. 
but you miss all the remaining phases of the turn. If this happens in another world, however, you are lost in time and space. The physical counterpart to that is unconscious. If you ever reach zero stamina, again, you lose half of your items and clue tokens, individually rounded down, you lose all of your retainers, and you are restored to one stamina. If this happens in Arkham, you are rushed to St. Mary's Hospital, which is right here, and miss all the remaining phases of your turn. If it happens in another world, you are lost in time and space. As mentioned previously, an investigator can also be delayed, in which case you lay their character standee down. When delayed, the only thing that they may do on their movement phase is stand up their standee. They do not gain movement points, and they cannot move. Investigators can also be arrested. If you are arrested, you are immediately sent to the jail cell space, which is right next to the police station. In this case, you lose half of your money, rounded down, and you're also delayed. In the event that you are lost in time and space, you are placed on the lost in time and space box and are delayed. So because you're delayed as soon as you enter that box, uh, you do not get to do anything your next turn. However, the turn after that, during the movement phase, you can actually move to any location in Arkham. As mentioned previously, your character can also become blessed or cursed. If you are blessed, then a 4 also counts as a success, so you have a 50-50 chance on each die of getting a success. If you are cursed, you get successes only on a 6, so you have a 1 in 6 chance of getting a success on each die. You can also be devoured. In the case that you are devoured, your character is destroyed utterly. Uh, you have to discard the investigator sheet and everything along with it, all items, everything. Uh, shuffle that sheet back into the investigator sheets and draw a new investigator and retrieve everything for them as though you're just starting at the beginning of the game. And you start your next turn as normal as your new character. In the event that a character is ever at zero stamina and sanity at the same time, they are devoured. Or, if their maximum sanity or stamina are ever reduced to zero, they are devoured. And finally, we're going to go over the many conditions under which the game ends. First of all, the Great Old One awakens immediately if the Doom Track is entirely full, too many gates are open, open in Arkham, so this is 8 gates in a 1-2 to player game, 7 in a 3-4 to player game, 6 in a 5-6 to player game, or 5 in a 7-8 to player game. The Great Old One also awakens if there are no gate markers left when you have to draw one, if there are no monsters in the Monster Cup when you have to draw one of those, or, as noted previously, if the terror level is 10 and too many monsters are in Arkham. In the event that the Great Old One awakes and you are not playing against Azathoth, you fill the Great Old One's Doom Track, if it is not already filled, and then you begin the final battle against the Great Old One. In this case, combat takes place over three phases, and this is repeated until either all of the investigators are dead, or until the Great Old One is defeated. First of all, the investigators refresh exhausted cards as usual, spend focus, etc. Next, the investigators attack, so each investigator in turn can make a combat check against the Great Old One, and all these successes are added together. When a number of successes equal to the number of investigators, including eliminated ones, is accumulated, you remove a token from the Doom Track and count up again from zero. After all of the investigators have attacked, the Great Old One attacks. Each Great Old One actually has a special attack that is noted on their card. Investigators that are unconscious or insane are immediately devoured and eliminated. In this case, you do not actually draw a new character. That player is simply out of the game. If all of the investigators are devoured, the investigators lose. And if the last Doom token is removed from the Great Old One, the investigators win. So as far as losing the game goes, the game is lost immediately if the Great Old One awakes and devours all of the, the investigators. Alternately, the players may actually win the game, and they may do this by closing all gates on the board. So in the event that you have just closed the last gate that exists on the Arkham board, you immediately win the game. If the investigators have a total number of gate trophies in their possession equal to the number of players. You also win the game immediately if you have sealed six gates in total. And finally, you actually win if you banish the Great Old One by defeating them in combat. And good luck with that. In the case that you win, uh, congratulations. 
uh, you get to score victory points and figure out how well you did. Demon Sultan has a thought, bubbles in confusion, center of the universe, shouting foul protrusion. So when choosing your characters at the beginning of the game, sometimes people tend to just sort of jump right in and just pick whoever they feel like. Uh, but it's usually a good idea to kind of get a, a rough idea of who's going to be playing what. And because of that, there's actually a few different roles that characters usually fall under. Uh, one of the most, most important ones is probably the combatant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the person who uh, has a lot of weapons, who, uh, you know, has bonuses to fight checks, etc. And this is the person who's going to be running around the board and cleaning up, cleaning up all the monsters in Arkham and, you know, clearing the way for uh, everyone else to get at uh, locations and stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The combatant might also be a magic user as well. Uh, the next type is also is going to be the explorer and is almost as important as the combatant. Uh, arguably more so in some regards because these are the ones that are going to be jumping into gates, they're going to be collecting clue tokens and avoiding combat at all costs. They're the ones that are basically trying to end the game as quick as possible and they are, they are in every way set up to do so. Mm -hmm. And finally there's sort of the support role. Uh, these uh, investigators are basically going to be, uh, you know, run, running around doing miscellaneous things like uh, gathering various uh, items that, you know, that usually these are people who uh, gain uh, extra money yeah. or, or that, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're pretty crucial too because, you know, it's, it's usually a lot easier for these people to go around and buy Elder Signs and things and then yeah. pawn them off to explorers or buy weapons and pawn them off to the combatants. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the supporter is kind of a thankless job almost, but it's, it's usually very important. And I mean, good supporters can win games. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really good idea when you're picking investigators to keep this stuff in mind because if everybody, for example, is running around, you know, fighting monsters, then no gates are going to get closed. <laughs> and then you're so, basically just game over at that yeah, point. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, there's no real hard and fast fast rules on this, but uh, and this it will vary depending on your group size. Uh, generally speaking, though, you're usually looking for like one combatant, one supporter, and the rest all explorers. Now, if you have a really big game, like if you have like an eight-player game or something like that, you'll probably need a few more combatants and maybe one more supporter. But uh, usually, generally speaking, you should probably have about half the group be explorers because like that's how you win the game. Like that's how the yeah, game is. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 very important to uh, remain focused too because mm -hmm. you know, again, if explorers start fighting things just because they have weapons, then nobody's closing gates, and, you know, it's it's really important to coordinate. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, by actually keeping your roles in mind, you can actually help to focus your sort of thing. Like Jason's saying, you might end, you might have someone in one role doing something that they really don't have to be doing. And, and uh, alternatively, you also have the entire board ahead of you. You could be doing anything at all. So sometimes people get uh, bogged down in the, what do I do? So this kind of gives you a little bit of a goal on what you can focus on. Mm -hmm. So, we hope you never have to fight the Great Old One, but it's going to happen eventually. So, if this seems inevitable, there's a couple little precautions you can take to make sure that uh, you actually have a chance, basically. Uh, first and foremost, it's pretty important to make sure that everybody can contribute a significant amount of dice to the pool. Absolutely. So, uh, a, a good rule of thumb is to be able to try to contribute 10 dice per person. I know that seems like a lot, but at this point you've probably accrued quite a few items, and, and most of the Hopefully. combat items give you a lot of dice. Absolutely. So it's, yeah. it's, it's not a, you know, unattainable goal. No, for sure. And for the most part, the Great Old One is going to be reducing this pool on you anyway. So being able to produce a 10 die pool doesn't necessarily mean every single round you're rolling 10 dice. It just means that you have 10 dice to start off with, and then the Great Old One takes them away from you. There are a couple of other uh, little tips that actually make things flow a lot eas more easily. Mm -hmm. uh, for starters, it's actually a really good uh, idea at the end of the Mythos phase to put a Doom token on top of the gate trophy stack. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is because one, one of the most common things to forget is to actually add a doom token to the track every time a gate's opened. And then, you know, you're looking at the doom track, there's not near enough doom tokens, you're trying to figure out how many turns it's been. Uh, so if there's actually a doom token on top of there, whenever you go to turn over a gate token, you see the doom token there, you know to put it on. And, like, personally, that's one of the hardest things for me to remember is actually adding that damn doom token. Uh, in addition to that, uh, to speed up the flow of the game, uh, let's say you have a, lo a lot of players in your game right now. Um, if every person is going to be receiving an encounter, generally speaking, uh, once you hand out the first encounter card to the first person that's having an encounter in the run of rounds, so the first player basically, 
uh, every other person in that chain takes an encounter card if possible. So if this person's in the uh, the purple section, they get a purple encounter card. If this person's in the yellow section, they get a yellow encounter card. And you just give them all out. That way, as soon as one player is done with their encounter card, the next player can just jump right into it. A lot of the times the game kind of gets bogged down by players um, you know, resolving their encounter card and then the next person saying, okay, now where am I? Okay, uh, hmm, do I want an encounter card or not? Hmm, uh, mm, mm, uh, eh. And then you've got five minutes wasted that could have just been them saying yay or nay one way or the other. One thing that should be noted here, however, is that the decks of encounter cards, cards are shuffled before each uh, player gets their encounter, technically. Mm -hmm. So if two people are in the same area and would be drawing from the same deck, technically you have to wait till the first person in that chain has uh, resolved their encounter before the second person can be resolved. Absolutely, because technically speaking, uh, if you don't do that, you're changing the probability of when encounters come up. And uh, although that may not necessarily be a big thing depending on your group, it does change how the game plays. It's, it's, it's small, but it's still a change. Yeah. Finally, we're going to talk about all those little tiny icons that are all over the uh, different location cards that you may ignore entirely or may be interested to find out what they do. Uh, so these icons are actually there to note the probabilities of those specific uh, types of things uh, occurring in that location. Each Arkham location on the board will actually have two symbols associated with it. Now, some of these symbols are going to be black, and that just indicates the that there is a special action associated with that location. Uh, some of them are actually going to be white, though, and what these indicate are the probability of that specific thing happening. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there's a list of all the icons on the back of the book, so you can reference that, but, uh, you know, if, if there's a picture of a clue token, that means that it's very uh, probable that a clue token is going to come up there. So you can actually kind of plan uh, what you're going to do based around those. Like, if you really need clue tokens, you might look for the clue token icon and go to that location, because you're more likely to actually get a clue token there. Mm -hmm. There's also more icons that you may actually see around the uh, other worlds. Um, these range between two to four uh, colors, and there's well, there's there's for one, there's four different colors, but uh, each each place could have two to four different ones. Um, the colors uh, obviously correspond the, to the different other world encounter cards you're going to be receiving uh, when you have other world encounters there. However, the colors also are sort of a, a warning uh, uh, as to how difficult that place is to go through. Um, now, this is sort of a uh, not like a catch-all sort of thing, but, but generally speaking, the green and blue encounters are usually a little bit lighter. They're pretty um, tame, yeah. I can't, I can't remember quite which one is, uh, is more tame. I think blue is more tame than, than green. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but regardless, the two, green and blue, generally are okay. Yellow and red, on the other hand, though, yellow is usually pretty moderate. Red's usually pretty severe. Yeah. Um, now, this isn't always the case, though. No, it's, it, again, this is sort of a... A generalization, mm -hmm. so, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a way just by looking at the, uh, the other worlds that you can, you know, sort of tell which ones are going to be more difficult. Look to the sky, way up on high, there in the night, stars on a right, beyond the past, now then at last, person was bright, gold runs away, they will return, mankind will learn, new kinds of fear, when they are here, they will reclaim, gold in their name, hopes turn to black, when they come back, here, no one fools, mankind will lose, where they will be, it's those again, stars probably coming, by many children, though the returning season of doom, scary, 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 scary solstice, very, 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 very scary solstice, but then the 